Well, every day we make many, 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 many decisions. More decisions than we probably are conscious of. So I'm making a decision right now to put my right foot forward. Now my left foot forward to look at you, to look at you, to breathe, to look to the back of the room, to look at the lights. I've just made a series of decisions in just a few seconds. You chose to respond to your alarm clock this morning. You chose which way you were going to swing your legs out of bed. You chose what you were going to eat for breakfast, which room you would enter, how you would open a door, how fast you would feed yourself, what you would put in your coffee. Some people estimate that we make north of 30,000 decisions every single day. Now, most of those decisions don't really matter that much. Whether I step back right now or step to the right, the left, look that way, look that way, it doesn't really change the world. But some of the decisions that we make literally are life or death decisions. Am I going to obey God or disobey God? Am I going to worship you? Am I going to worship myself? Am I going to worship material things? Am I going to worship the true and living God? Am I going to leave my Bible closed? Am I going to open my Bible? Am I going to pray? What am I going to pray? What kind of an attitude am I going to have towards you? What kind of an attitude am I going to have towards you, depending on the attitude that you have towards me? You get my point. We're constantly making decisions, and some of them are benign, but some of them are absolutely titanic. And on a spiritual level, each of us is really only one decision away from disaster. You could make a decision today that destroys your life, that robs you of God's blessings, that dishonors God. And so it's important for us to consider our decisions. And while it may not be possible for us to consider all of those little micro decisions that I mentioned, it is important for us to consider the big decisions that we're making on a regular basis. Now, on God's end of our relationship, God is always faithful. God is faithful, but humans are always one bad decision away from disaster. And so when God comes our way, And he warns us through his word. When you hear the word of God, whether I'm preaching it or you're reading it or it's in your small group and someone says, hey, do this. Look what the Bible says. You should do this. You would do well to do that. If the Bible says, don't do that, you would do well not to do that. So it's important for us to heed the word of God, not be passive, not be lackadaisical, not yawn when God gives us a command, a rule, a regulation, a warning. It's important for us to be awake and conscientious as Christians so that we are making good decisions and not bad decisions. We have been studying the book of 1 Kings, and the dominant figure in the opening 11 chapters of 1 Kings is King Solomon. And King Solomon was an incredibly wise individual. He asked God at Gibeon for wisdom, not wealth, not fame, not a long life. He asked God for wisdom and God was like, wow, that's a good request. So I'm going to give you wisdom. I'm going to give you wisdom beyond measure. And God used Solomon's wisdom, his intellect, his thoughtfulness to stabilize the nation, to make the nation incredibly wealthy. And then use this man to oversee the building of perhaps one of the greatest monuments ever built in human history, the first temple in Israel, and the palace complex that surrounded that. But we've already preached chapter 11. You remember we jumped ahead and preached chapter 11, and his life did not end well. So we got a lot of years of greatness, fame, blessing. He blessed the nations. The people were so wealthy. Silver was almost worthless. The people lived joyful lives. They were glad to worship God. But the wheels fell off the cart at the end of the day. And that's a reminder to us that no matter how great you are, no matter how wise you are, no matter how skilled you are, no matter how useful you are, you are one decision away from disaster. Don't ruin your life. Don't ruin your life. I know hundreds of Christians that have ruined their lives, that have been faithful for a year five years, 10 years, and then toward the end of their life, they just throw it away. They just lose focus. They get bored. They get addicted. They get distracted. 
and they throw it all away. I know I can name hundreds, not tens, hundreds of people that I've known in the past that were walking with Christ and are no longer walking with Christ today. Don't be among them. Don't be in the next batch of apostates. Don't be in the next batch of flaky, failed Christians. And you don't have to be. So while we are only one decision away from disaster, how can we avoid failing God? Well, the answer is not tricky. God is not trying to keep secrets from you. It's actually rather simple, at least to understand, but it takes work to apply. So how do we avoid failing God, making bad decisions, blowing it, ending our lives in despair or disaster? Solomon went above and beyond in the public adoration of God. We read about his grand worship service. It was pretty incredible. He spent more money than you and I will ever collectively have on the temple. It was a massive service, but he eventually blew it, even though he had ample warning. Again, God in Solomon's life, there's at least three major points where God visits him. He visits him at Gibeon early in his reign when he asks for wisdom. He visits the nation collectively when the temple was dedicated. You can read more about that in 2 Chronicles chapter 7. God showed up. He visited it, the temple at its consecration. Fire fell from heaven. That's pretty cool. Fire fell from heaven and burned up the tens of thousands of animals that they were offering. And now God makes a second very personal visit to Solomon, recorded for us in 1 Kings chapter 9. So there's the personal visit, the corporate visit, now a second personal visit. And he offers to bless him. But in the process of blessing him, he also offers a warning. God offers to bless you, but there's also a warning to be had. Solomon has a decision to make. You have a decision to make. Faithfulness or failure? What's it going to be? Faithfulness or failure? True worship or false worship? True worship or false worship? How do we avoid Falling God, uh, failing God. Well, the first thing we need to do is avail ourselves of God's beautiful, sustaining grace. We need to avail ourselves of God's beautiful, sustaining grace. In 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 1, the word of God says, As soon as Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord and the king's house and all that Solomon desired to build, the Lord appeared. I want you to take special note of the initiator of the meeting, God. Solomon's working, he's doing great things. But it says, the Lord appeared. That's grace right there. God shows up. God has a word for his creatures. God speaks a truth to you. God is about to say something. God shows up. God appears. The fact that we have a Bible where God, that God has written things to us is grace. That's all grace. The fact that you can look and say, oh, what does God think? That's grace. God has not left us in the dark. The Lord appeared to Solomon a second time as he appeared to him at Gibeon. And the Lord said to him, so let's lean in. What does he have to say to Solomon? I have heard your prayer and your plea, which you have made before me. I have consecrated this house that you have built by putting my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. God wants relationship. God wants us to obey. God responds to prayer. God is gracious. He's not like some mean old father or mother that abandons their child and takes no interest in them. He's not like, some government agency that you have to call and remain on hold for hours and hours and hours, wondering if you'll ever get through. It's not like that. He's not like someone that just walks by you in the mall, doesn't know your name, doesn't make eye contact, doesn't care about you, doesn't acknowledge your humanity, couldn't care less if you exist or don't exist. That's not God. God is a relational God. 
Solomon's circumstances were both big structures that he built had been completed. God had appeared to him again at Gibeon. He appeared to him in the consummation of the temple. God now speaks a word to Solomon. And notice it's 1 Kings chapter 9. So we got to get through 1 Kings chapter 10. And then 1 Kings chapter 11 is the disaster chapter. So I think God is anticipating that Solomon is not headed in the right direction. So he shows up in advance of his sin. By the way, whenever you sin as a Christian, God has always shown up in advance. Nobody can say, wow, I wasn't expecting uh, that temptation. God's already warned you. Well, it's God's fault because he didn't adequately equip me. No, he's equipped you. God always warns, he forewarns, he equips, he cautions us. I mean, assuming you're in his word, (laughs) assuming you're praying, assuming you're not ignoring him. Whenever we sin, we always have a forewarning. And now God speaks to Solomon because God wants to encourage faithfulness. He, He wants you to be spiritually successful. I hope you know that. God wants you to be spiritually successful, but God knows this. Even wise men can become fools just like that. Even committed people like you and me can lose our way. Even people that are passionate about worship, passionate about purity, passionate about getting it right, we can lose our way like that, folks. So we have to walk humbly. You've probably heard it said before, be humble or you'll stumble. And humility is fundamentally predicated on obedience. Obedience to God. Doing what he has said, listening to his words of warning. Solomon had worked well for God. All believers should work well for God. Solomon had poured it out on the line for God. He put his money on the on the table he organized he strategized he administered he rallied the troops to worship i mean he put on one of the greatest worship services in human history he prayed an incredible prayer publicly to god standing kneeling he had done wonderful things for god and god approved of his work God did approve of his work. God appreciated his work. God acknowledged his work. God acknowledges your work today. But it doesn't work like this. Well, I've worked for God for many, many years. I've served more than anyone else, so I can just kind of cruise now for the rest of my life. Surely God owes me a little sin time. Surely God would be okay if I'm a faithful servant of God for us, for me to spend, you know, a few years wandering in the proverbial wilderness. That's not how it works. God's standards are perfection from beginning to end. You don't get credit with God. Well, I've I've done 10 good things, so now I can do one bad thing. Solomon did a lot of incredible things for God, and God approved of his work. When we work as unto the Lord, we have God's approval. But it doesn't mean we can then sit in our hands and lose our way or let our guard down. So here we have a God of grace, It's gracious of God to accept our work as pleasing and honoring to him. It's a gracious act of God for us to even appear to us, which he did to Solomon. It's a gracious act of God to warn us. It's a gracious act when God acknowledges our faithfulness, when God blesses us for our past past service. That's because God is loving and merciful. Hear me again. God is loving and he is merciful, but God is not a pushover. You ever hear people talk about God and they're like, well, God is loving and he's merciful. So they're sinning or maybe someone else is sinning and they're trying to excuse it. So we're like, God is loving and merciful. So why should we really care that much about that? It's almost like they have this notion, well, if God is loving and merciful, that means he's a pushover. Some parents have that notion of love. They think, well, I want to be loving and merciful. So I'm just going to let my kids do whatever they want. That's not love. That's not mercy. That, that's not the kind of God that we serve. God is loving and merciful, but he is also permanently just. And justice means 
that he cannot let even the tiniest little sin go unnoticed or unpunished. He never turns, turns a blind eye to sin. Every sin, sins of the mind, sins of the mouth, sins of the hands, sins of the feet, every sin that has ever been committed that is going to be forgiven by God must be atoned for. He, he, will ne- he will not permit the most, what you and I might consider the most microscopic sin to go unatoned for if he is going to forgive that sin. So he is loving and he is merciful. <clears throat> he wants to acknowledge our faithfulness, but he's not a pushover. He will never surrender his holiness for anyone. He will not surrender his holiness for you just because you've served him better than the person sitting next to you. It's like, well, I'm, I'm one of those Christians. I've served for 20, 30, 40 years. I was a missionary to Africa or whatever. I've given more money than anyone else. Okay, fine, great. God will acknowledge that. That's a wonderful thing. But God's not gonna say, well, then I'm gonna allow you a season of sin and I'll just give you a pass on that because you've been a good little boy or girl for so long. That's not how God rolls. He does not operate that way. He never reduces his standard. Again, some people think God's love means he overlooks sin. He does not. He demands holiness. God is a jealous God. We often think of jealousy as a negative um, characteristic because it's usually selfish when it appears in the life of a human. Not always. A husband should be jealous to guard his, his, his marriage from any uh, external assaults. But Normally, we think of the word jealousy in a negative way, but God is a jealous God, and he deserves to be. He is the original one. He's the creator. He is God, and he will guard his own holiness and his standards and his position infinitely and eternally. Not that he's ever going to lose it, but he'll still guard it. He deserves He deserves absolute homage, worship. He's creator. We are creatures. we got to remember that. There's a creature-creator distinction. So make sure this is clear in your head. How do you guard yourself against failure? You have to make sure this is crystal clear in your head. Who's the boss? God's the boss. Who's in charge? God's in charge. Who serves who? We serve God. Who does the appearing? Who initiates? God. Okay, so let's keep that in the forefront of our mind. Again, I didn't say this was going to be particularly profound, but it's fundamental and it needs to be said. Who's the boss? Who's your boss? Is God like the little guy you kind of carry around to accomplish your plan for your life? If so, that ain't God. It's a genie in a bottle. You exist fundamentally for his glory. He does not exist to make your life better. You exist for his glory. You are his servant. He's the boss. And when he comes, he will bless. But when he has a word of warning, we would do well to listen very carefully. So how do we do that? How can we avoid failing God? Through obedience. So here's what God says to him. And as for you, so previous God had said, I'm going to be there forever. But not in a literal forever. There's an if, if condition to this. So I'm going to be there forever. So I'm, I'm willing to abide. I'm willing to receive your worship. I'm willing to bless. I'm willing to acknowledge your faithfulness. But let's talk about your side of the bargain. And as for you, If you will walk before me as David, your father, walked, and notice what that looks like. There's an internal and an external dimension. With integrity of heart and uprightness, so that's the internal, doing according to all that I have commanded you, that's the external with with some internal in there as well, and keeping my statutes and my rules, then I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever. As I promised David, your father, saying, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. It's very important if we're going to understand covenants and their relationship to atonement to see that little if statement there. 
The if clause ensures, listen carefully, ensures that when God offers blessing, he never violates his own justice. The if clause ensures that when God offers to bless, show mercy, that he never is put in a position where he has to violate his own justice, where he has to overlook sin. So there's always an if clause implied in covenant. God will never and never has bound himself. Listen to this. God has never bound himself to covenant, to relationship, ever, that required him to overlook evil. Never. God has never and God will never bind himself to a relationship, to a covenant, to an agreement with his creatures that will will cause him to overlook evil. Every sin requires atonement. And while the superiority of the new covenant under which we live as Christians rests on the eternal righteousness of Christ, upon which God can remain in perpetual, ongoing, permanent relationship with his redeemed people because Christ is our substitute and Christ is perpetually righteous, no old covenant ever made is without a condition for righteousness. That's not how God operates. I'm going to enter into a relationship. I'm going to do things for you, but you can just do whatever you want. He always has an if clause implied. There always has to be a way to make sure that God doesn't violate his own perfection, his holiness, his standard for perfection. And of course, because we mess up all the time under the new covenant, we have Christ as our substitute. So that ensures that God will never violate his justice because he always looks to the perfection of Christ, the atoning work of Christ, and applies it to the sinning saint to keep us in perpetual covenant with God. This is why we would never say that one is saved by works. But in some respects, we are. We are saved by works. The works of Christ. The work of Christ. Not our work, but the work of Christ. Because someone had to pay for our sins. So here we see God initiating. He is gracious but he's always demanding obedience. This is really, really important. Again, I want to stress this. It's really important in an age where love, the love of God is sometimes understood as permissive. You hear this in the love is love movement. You can love who you want. You can do what you want because isn't God loving? Not in that way, no. He's actually not. That's not love. Because God's love is always bound to his justice, his holiness, his standards. Well, God is gracious. He'll give you a pass on that. I'm sure he won't mind that you're a little bit of a blasphemer, a little bit of an adulterer, a little bit of a thief. (laughs) Yeah, he minds. God offers grace, but that sin always has to be atoned for. God never turns a blind eye towards sin. Now, he doesn't always... Expect that we will be the ones that are the first to recognize our own sin. And he certainly understands that we cannot atone for our own sin. And so again, we have Christ at the center. But there's still a call here for obedience. You'll notice that the language of the text is if you walk. So you'll know if you've been around here for a little while that walking is a metaphor for obedience. So we often talk about our three W's we worship Christ, we work for Christ. We walk with Christ. This is part of being a disciple. We're worshiping him. We're attributing worth to him. We're engaging in acts of service for him. And walking with him. I have a relationship with God. I want want to improve that relationship. So walking is a metaphor for obedience. And the kind of obedience that God wants out of me is called integrity of heart and uprightness. So um, you you cannot know my heart. I mean, you could do an ectocardiogram and see how it's functioning biologically, but all you have of Aaron Rock is the externals. That's all you have. My dashing good looks and my deeds, my good deeds, my bad deeds, my words, my actions. You don't know my heart, but God knows my heart and God is concerned about my heart. And we should be concerned about our own hearts. We can fake it till we make it in the eyes of the world or the church. But God is concerned about your heart. 
he's, he's concerned, like, for example, if you are like a, you're critical towards everyone. Nobody can ever measure up to your standards. God's concerned about that. You despise people. You hate people. God's concerned about that. Your, your heart is cold. Like, you're, you're not moved by words like abortion, infanticide, euthanasia, murder. Doesn't, doesn't bother you. That's a cold heart. God is concerned about that. So while we need to be thick-skinned in a difficult and challenging world, we always need to be tender-hearted toward the things of God, asking God to soften our hearts to feel towards sin and others the way Christ feels toward us. And uprightness of heart and integrity of heart is primarily about consistency. You know this, that a person of integrity is not a person that always gets it right, but predictably they, they do get it right. Like generally they get it right. They're sort of predictable in a good way. So God is concerned about our internal righteousness, and we should always be working on that. And then he's also concerned with our external righteousness, following his commands. So if God says jump, you say, how high? If God says go, you're like, on my way. If God says no, you're like, I'm done with that then. So obedience. And I would just suggest to you on, on the level of uh, wisdom that it's easier to be obedient when you just do it right away. Like don't mull it over, reflect, oh, should I or should, just do it. Isn't that the kind of child a parent loves? Go clean your room. Oh, I don't want to. Okay, I'll go do it. Doesn't matter whether they like it or not. Doesn't matter whether they're, it's firing them up or not. Just go do it. Like make life easier for me as your dad and make life easier on your behind. Just go, just go do it, right? And it's the same with God. It's just much easier, frankly, to be a simple-minded Christian in that respect. Just God says, do it. Okay, I'll do it. Don't make things over, overly complex. And if we're a little confused, well, God allows mature believers to speak into our lives to bring clarity. God gives us his word to bring clarity. So internal and external. So please don't be the kind of person that is, a di is different on Sunday than you are on Monday. Just don't be that person. Don't be different in what you watch, think, say when you're all by yourself than, than with, your, with your church friends, your family. Just integrity. Be consistent. Take you a long way in life. People appreciate consistency. They appreciate integrity. Even though you have flaws, everyone has flaws. Just, just be a person of integrity. Really important. God appreciates it and others will appreciate it. So what is the blessing that God offers Solomon? A dynasty of Solomonic kings. A dynasty of Solomonic kings. Now, how many generations did this all work out for Solomon and his progeny? Not even one. Not even one. So the end of the story is that Solomon did not obey this, and his son turned out to be a goofball that ruined the nation, that split it politically. It was untrustworthy. He was a clown. He was immature. He was childish. He destroyed the nation economically. He destroyed the nation politically, and he destroyed the nation spiritually which bad leaders always do. They never just destroy one thing. They destroy everything. He destroyed it all. So this, God is issuing a warning in like real time here. God knows what's going to happen. This is real stuff. It's not some theoretical problem. And it's a reminder to us that we are only one decision, one generation away from disaster. One. I'm a Christian parent, I bring my kids to church. But if you are not conscientious in raising your kids to Christ, they will be the Rehoboams of the next generation. Clowns, goofballs, failures. People that bring chaos and destruction rather than or order in life. It might stress you out. It's not meant to stress you out. Just follow the teachings of the Bible and God will bless. So what place do these elements play under the new covenant if our righteousness is in Christ? 
So if God's calling us to internal righteousness and external righteousness and you're processing and you're right, okay, but that was Old Testament, we're under the New Testament, we're under the New Covenant. Our righteousness is Christ, he's gracious. Where do, where do works factor in to the Christian life? Where do works factor in? Are we to respond, well, let go and let God. You ever heard that? Just let go and let God. Just live however you want. It's all God's grace. He's, he's paid for your sin. Don't, don't worry about it. Don't worry about your cheating, your adultery, and your lying, and all this sort of stuff. You know, it's, it's let go and let God. Is it faith without works? It seems to me the New Testament writer James sought to answer that question. He did a pretty good job of it. Is it, is it faith without works? Is that we're just grace, we're just grace only people here. We're just faith only. God can do his thing. I have trust in him so I can live like a son of hell and still be a son of heaven. Is that, is that the proper Christian mindset? No, 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 no. Works has a critical place in the Christian life. Number one, they are evidence of salvation. The less you obey, the more your assurance is in the toilet. Less you obey, you're a Christian. I'm not sure if I'm saved or not. What sin is in your life? Is there evidence of salvation? Secondly, it's a responsive love to God. Our good deeds are a responsive love to God. If you love me, you're not going to come up, punch me, beat me, steal from me, abuse me. You're going to treat me well. We're in relationship. We're friends. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. And in the same way, our good deeds, like if, if you understand God's love and mercy, why would you not want to obey him? You have nothing to lose and everything to gain, and it honors and blesses him. So you can kind of take a bit of a, a, a thermometer, if you will, and, and measure your love for God by your obedience to him. And the third thing is that it is a witness to the world. Perhaps one of the greatest historical criticisms against Christians is their hypocrisy. Now, some of it is feigned, right? Some of it is feigned. It's fake. It's falsified. Unbelievers are always looking for a chink in your armor. And we're like, yeah, we're, yeah, we're, we're, we are hypocrites at times. We do fail. That's why we're here. That's why we need God. So some of it is, is not a legitimate accusation. But if we say, well, we're, you know, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. We follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we're still divorcing our spouses. We're still gossips and slanders. Our kids are still little Rehoboams. We're still disastrous with our money. We're still swearing and blaspheming and cursing. Well, of course the world's going to look at us and say, whatever, whatever. You guys are all fakes. I, don't want, I want nothing to do with your religion. So our good deeds are a witness to the world. And by the way, they're not just a witness in terms of some theoretical thing. They're also a blessing to the world. The people around you are blessed. When you act like Jesus Christ, even if they don't love Jesus Christ, they're still blessed by it. Christ brings life. Have you noticed that? He brings order. He brings hope. What do the antichrists of our world bring? Chaos, death, destruction, confusion. The Christian life properly lived is one of its greatest apologetics. One of its greatest defenses is the fact that the Christian life properly lived works. It works maritally, it works familially, it works politically, it works medically, it works scientifically, it works. The Christian life properly lived brings blessing to the world. But if it's falsified or faked, it's a disaster. So hear me, brothers and sisters, you will never, ever have to worry about falling away from God unless you first fall out of step with God and out of love with God. You'll never have to worry about it. But if you have that internal and that external lined up, you are in love with God, you are worshiping him, and if you, I would add the third thing to that, you'll never have to worry if you are following God's calling to be a faithful witness in the world. So just concern yourself with these things. Concern yourself with not falling out of step, not falling out of love, and not falling out of your calling for God. And he will very much sustain you. How else do we avoid failing God? Well, acknowledging the consequences if we do. But if you turn aside from following me, 
you and your children. So notice there's, there's always a generational impact. I'm, inf I'm influenced positively or negatively by my parents. I will influence my kids positively or negatively, and so will you. They will be, <clears throat> you will influence your kids more than anyone else, more than school, more than the children's ministry director, the youth pastor. You will have the greatest influence on your kids. They may never admit that, but the way they think, the patterns of thinking, their values or priorities, you as parents will shape them more than anyone else and you will be shaped by your parents. But if you turn away from following me, you and your children, and do not keep my commandments and my statutes that I've set before you, well, I'll just turn to blind eye. Now, that's not what the text says. But go and serve other gods. This is critical, but go and serve other gods and worship them. Notice God just assumes that if you're gonna no longer worship him, you're gonna worship something else because that's true. There's no, neutral, there's no neutrality in worship. This is a lie of secularism. And it's been beaten into the Western mind that there's somehow this neutral ground in the middle. It's called secularism. Where no, no God takes supremacy over any other. And it's sort of a neutral space where everyone can kind of come out on the, the, the playing field and they can play their own little game and they'll never interfere with anyone else. It, it's, that is a, a lie. As soon as you stop worshiping God, you're worshiping something else immediately. You're always worshiping something or someone, always. Every moment of your day, you are affirming an authority. You are living for something and you're affirming some sort of a legal code. You are always, you are a worshiper. You're always worshiping something. It might be you. It might be the state. It might be Allah. It might be the Krishna God. You're always worshiping something, always. So do not turn aside from my commandments that I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them. Notice the reference to idolatry, false worship. So to make it really simple for all of us, sin is always a worship problem. Write it down. Commit it to memory. Sin is always, 100% of the time, a worship problem. Always. It's always about who's your daddy? Who's the boss? Who's in charge? What authority do I subscribe to? What authority do I acknowledge? What authority do I reject? Sin is always a worship problem. It's always about who your authority is. How? How? Well, it's about prioritizing someone or something else over God as the object of your affection and obedience. It could be a man, ladies. It could be a woman, men. It could be your church, churchians. It could be your career, career-minded people. It could be your money. It could be entertainment. We're all worshiping. We're worshiping from the moment we wake up to the moment we go to bed, we're worshiping. The question is, who are we worshiping? And it's a generational problem. This is why family worship is huge. Please, please, please do your kids a favor. And do not make this cataclysmic divide that so many Christian families do between what happens on Sunday, what happens for the rest of the week. It's all integrated. If, we, if I show up at your house on a Wednesday, it should more or less look and feel the same way in terms of values and conduct as it does on Sunday afternoon. It has to be this. We have to be integrated. It's not, well, God gets Sunday and then Beelzebub gets Monday, et cetera. It's a generational problem. And while God is gracious in the process what I've noticed, and I think the Proverbs attest to this and the way God works, is generally when the parents get it right, the kids follow. And when the parents lose their way or they're not serious about it, the kids lose their way and they're not serious about it either. I have the advantage of now watching several generations. And while there's exceptions to the rule, sometimes generations hit the reset button. 
generally the apple doesn't fall very far from the tree. And so that tells us that God uses human beings, parents, and their decisions to influence their kids, which is kind of scary. <laughs> but, but there's also some hope there. What does God say? If you do these things, if you worship the wrong God, what does he say? Then I will cut off Israel from the land. Notice God is not afraid of being harsh. This idea that God is some sort of a passive, never wants to speak boldly, kind of wimpy God. It's so unbiblical. Then I will cut off Israel from the land that I have given them and the house that I have consecrated for my name I will cast out of my sight and Israel will become a proverb and a byword among the peoples. Wait a second. God is willing to ruin a $300 billion building just because of disobedience? Yep. They'll just crush it all. That's how principled God is. That's how consistent he is. You could give him every last dime on planet earth. But he will not be bought off by it. He's relatively impressed, meaning he's impressed with it if it's a reflection of heart obedience, but he's actually not impressed with the it at all. He's not impressed with any of it. He'll blot it out and wipe it out just like that. This house will become a heap of ruins, he said. Every, everyone passing by it will be astonished and will hiss. They will say, why has the Lord done thus to this land and to this house? Then they will say, because they abandoned the Lord, their God, who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt and laid hold on other gods and worshiped them and serve them. Therefore, the Lord has brought all this disaster on them. Your obedience is part of your testimony. Your disobedience is your anti-testimony. Your disobedience and God's subsequent judgment is a testimony to God's holiness and faithfulness, that God is a just God who does not allow sin to go unpunished. All of these chapters, I tried to go through it in detail with you, describing the goal, the effort, the work, the unfathomable man hours, the expertise that people brought to building the temple and the palace. And yet God is so holy. He's like, I'll, I'll wipe it all out. I'll crush it like an ant, like that. If you disobey me, so let us never, ever make the mistake. Well, God, I've been pastoring for over 30 years. I've poured it out for you. Like, give me a little bit of time to sin. Give me a little time to myself. Like, aren't you gonna, aren't you gonna put my good works on a big old scale? So my good deeds, as long as they outweigh my few sins, you're gonna overlook them. God's like, no, I overlook nothing. I will crush you, Aaron Rock, like an ant. If you think you can get away from rebelling against me, I will demolish Harvest Bible Church. I will crush the church in Canada if it does not obey me. I owe you nothing. Isn't this a wake-up call for God's people to purify themselves and to pursue obedience under the grace of God? Solomon's dynasty lasted one generation. This could be a mosque a generation from now. This could be a strip club a generation from now. If the people of God do not humble themselves and worship him and him alone and obey, we are one step away from disaster, folks. It's happened in the past. The temple that Solomon built, by the way, has not existed for over 2,000, 2,500-ish years. It's long gone. Because Solomon did not obey the word of the Lord all that time, all that effort, and he ended his life in disaster. Don't be like Solomon. Earlier, it's like, be like Solomon, but really don't be like Solomon. Be consistent, be steadfast, 
as unto the Lord. Remind yourself that all sin is a worship problem. So when we get our worship right, and it seems to me that corporate worship is a great place to start learning that from one another. When we get our worship light right, we avoid sin and we avoid the judgment of God. So if you want to position yourself for ongoing success and faithfulness as a Christian, make sure you never forget who the boss is. Make sure you never forget who the boss is. Avoid sin, obey God, avoid his judgment, avail yourself of his promises. And when we do, we position ourselves for divine blessing. Who wouldn't want some more of that? Well, it's available to us right now. So let's pray to that end. 